Hey everyone, today I've got an awesome new detail node to go through. I also have a brand new technique around masking and a super secret technique, which I didn't even realize you could do, but it's going to be a game changer for quick wardrobe changes. And also, if you want to get cool renders of all the top SDXL models, hit that join button and let's get into it. Okay, first, we're going to get into a brand new technique that came out very, very recently. This is a follow-up from the last video around attention guidance. This is called perturbed attention guidance. Sounds a little weird, but at the end of the day, it really helps bring additional detail into your models. Now, there's actually two different flavors. Originally, it was a separate node, uh, but it's been since uh, integrated into kind of the comfy uh, main platform. So you have kind of a simple uh, flavor, the one on the left here, uh, you can see by the little fox, and then you have kind of a more advanced version. And the more advanced version isn't part of the native platform, uh, but if you search in your Comfy Manager for Perturbed, uh, you can install it and you can uh, use it then. So the cool thing is it's a very simple way to add additional detail to your existing image, right, to the existing way it's being rendered. And so think of it almost like CFG, right? When you have CFG very, very low, your images are not going to have a lot of detail. When you have it really high, uh, it has a lot. And if you make it too high, then it starts to burn out. So this is a similar sort of concept. Uh, if we look at the, the low node, and we're going to go into an actual example here, actually a few examples. Um, if you find the right level to include here for your scale, you'll find it brings a lot of additional detail without burning out your image. Um, and then additionally, in the advanced version, you not only have that skill, but you have a couple of other options to you know, bring it back a little bit. So for example, uh, you can start at a little high, but you add this adaptive scale, which kind of kind of cuts out some of the, uh, the outer limits of that additional detail, which prevents a lot of that burnout. Um, and then you can also kind of define the methodology for how it's doing that additional detail. Honestly, I haven't found a whole ton of uh, benefit between these options. Uh, if anything, it's between the middle and the output one uh, that I have found the most uh, change. But again, it's it's very, very little, generally speaking. Um, but let's get into an actual example here. Very simple prompt. Ice cream cone in a dish. I added my kind of photorealistic negative uh, prompt items. And I have my two examples here. Now, if I just look at the example output for both of them, you can see we hit both of the prompts perfectly, right? We've got ice cream cones in a dish. Ice cream cones in a dish. So we have the results 100% uh, in both of them. However, even though they have the same exact settings for the rendering, in the second example, I've included that uh, perturbed node with a 2.5 scale. And you can see all the additional details that's, that's being provided. So you see like the syrup, you see the countertop has a little more detail and contrast. You have some cones in the background, right? Sometimes you may not want that extra detail, and that's perfectly fine. But you could see this is where the advantage comes in, where you're not spending lots of extra render time to get to this point, but you get a lot of great extra fidelity into your output. And one thing to note, compared to the attention version that we did in the last video, the memory requirements as well as the processing time was not significantly more for this perturbed version versus the attention one. So I definitely recommend using this node uh, going forward instead of the attention one. Uh, you can use the attention one as well, uh, but I find this one's a little more effective and a little bit easier to use in terms of the reliability of the results. So that's the first example. I'm gonna kind of scroll down here to example two. Now, uh, I brought in the advanced version for both of these, just again, to show a little bit of the difference. And at first glance, you can see they're pretty much exactly the same. You can see a little difference in terms of the faces here, but you can also see how significantly uh, the scale is different here. Now, as we were talking about before, right, if the scale is too high, if I was to put 30 in just the normal version, it'd be completely burned out, almost completely white, I'd say. But this adaptive scale attribute helps to, again, lead out some of those uh, edges, which brings more detail in without burning out your image. Now, 
I have a quick comparison node here just to show you the difference. So if I just quickly scan across, right, you can see pretty much the image is the same. Uh, you can see there's a necklace here that's a little different. You can see there's a little more contrast here. Uh, the waves uh, have a little bit more detail there as well. But the background in the bokeh is exactly the same. So you're not really losing any of that background detail. And if I do the same thing for this other version, if I'm looking across it, there's obviously a significant change in the face. Uh, but again, more detail in the contrast, more detail in the waves, uh, and the no disfiguration uh, in the hands as well. So it's definitely a worth it uh, node to have, I'd say, pretty much for your regular render flow uh, without you losing any major detail. In this example, you have, uh, again, normal sort of prompt. Uh, one interesting piece, so at the end here, I have these owner's shoes that I want to include. And you can see in the first, you know, kind of main version, uh, you have an owner with shoes being worn, worn in the second one, but not in the third. So this is actually more correct for what we were looking for. We were just looking for the shoes. And uh, if you're just to look at the comparison between the two, there's a pretty significant change between these two versions as well as these two versions as well. So, you know, some of it will uh, rely on the prompting, um, but you can see in this case, I only changed the scale by a very little amount with no adaptive scale here and a little bit here um, with a little bit of adaptive scale. So again, it, it will vary quite a bit. And the final one, again, I just wanted to show you with the basic node, how different things can look and depending on how much detail you wanna bring in. So you can see between the first two versions, you know, there's a lot of additional detail here. You can see a lot of the sunburst here, a lot of more detail in the stars and the even the texturing. And of course, you know, with a even a higher uh, perturbed scale, it's even more right now. The disadvantage, of course, of this is if you have too much detail, you can it, it's almost too crisp. But that might be the look that you're going for. So it really depends on the output that you're looking for. If you want a softer look, which which is a little more diffused, you may not want to use the perturb node, and that's fine. Uh, but this is really a fantastic way to get that additional detail. Okay, our next area is around uh, what we call mask stroking. So as opposed to just defining a mask across entire area of your image, we're going to actually do just the outline, which is valuable because sometimes you, if you have an image here, I have a hacker here, you know, I may want to just have part of the outline of a person or a face or of a mask uh, to have an effect without actually affecting the whole image. So in this example, I actually did two different renders. I have my dyno masking to select the whole face. I have that in both cases. And if I was to just do an in-paint using a glowing purple lightning electric arcs, blah, 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 you could see it significantly changes the overall face as well as add the purple electric uh, effect which again might be something that you're looking for. Um, I do have a high denoise, and that's of course the reason for that is because I want the really sharp kind of saturated look of the of the effect of the, uh, the special effect. So, you know, obviously if you could reduce the overall denoise, it's going to obviously reduce the effect and the amount of detail in the, um, in the in painting, but that may not be what you're looking for. But just to show you the effect, and I'll show you how we did it, we have exactly the same settings. In this case, I have my purple arcing, but I kept the face exactly where I wanted it to be. If you're trying to do any sort of special effects that has uh, where you want the main subject to be preserved, just doing the outline in a mask to do the in painting is going to be very, very effective for you. So how do we do this? How do we do the stroking? It's actually quite simple. Uh, it does use the layer style node that we uh, covered uh, several videos ago, but uh, there's a utility called uh, under the layer mask area called mask stroke. And essentially, you're feeding in the mask. So in this case, the mask is obviously being generated by Dino here uh, by the segment anything. I'm selecting the face. So it's selecting the whole face. And I'm taking that mask and I'm now just taking the outline of the mask itself. So I'm stroking around the mask just like you would in a Photoshop layer. You're applying a stroke. So you can both grow the stroke as well as grow the width uh, of the stroke. And so in this case, I did a 40 pixel sort of outline with just a little bit of growth internal. And that 
really outlines the shape of the face. You can change this as much or as little as you want. And based on that change, that'll affect the overall in painting. And just so you can see, it's the same sort of you know output from the mask stroke. This is now your final mask that's going into your in painting node. And that's obviously then going to be rendered as you can see here. So we have both examples there. So lots of really cool things you can do this. You can you don't have to select it around just a face. You can select uh, entire people. You can draw manual masks and have effects applied there or even not even effects. You can add additional subject matter uh, items in as well. So very, very powerful technique. All right, on to our secret bonus. So we all know about face detailer, right? We want to be able to change a face, fix a face. Maybe we want to have the, a slightly different expression on the face. That's fantastic. But what if I was to tell you that you don't have to actually do faces at all? Let's say I wanted to do what I've been doing with, you know, uh, segmenting and uh, and dino masks, etc. But instead, I want to use the face detailer. And you're like, wait, that makes no sense. Face detailer is for faces. Um, but in fact, it does not have to be. So I found this video the other day. I've, I forgot who it was, but it was really cool. And essentially, uh, if we look down here in our kind of model that we're defining, most of the time you're going to define the face model, right, for your face detailer. But in fact, there are other models you can bring in. So for example, there's a new model, newer, it's probably, I think, been out for a couple months now at least, called Deep Fashion. And Deep Fashion is focused on just selecting fashion, clothes, etc., cetera, uh, from the area and then rendering it. So now, if I were to just type in purple dress, and literally my image is going directly from my sampler into my face detailer as I normally would. And then I'm going to now just output that into a preview. There you go. It keeps the face. It'll usually keep the posing exactly the same, but it literally will switch out uh, the clothes. And this is fantastic, right? It won't give you the level of detail you need for uh, like an uh, in painting uh, adapter, like the new IP adapter uh, version that where you can do, be much more specific. However, for a quick change, for a quick swap out, uh, this is fantastic. It's very quick. And you can also, of course, if you want just a little bit of change uh, of the, you know, sort of look and feel of the clothing, you can change the denoise level, right? So if you keep it much lower, call it 0 0.3, 0 0.4, it's a lot less. And of course, if you get it much higher, then it's going to do a bigger change. Of course, if you get too high, then it'll, you know, not uh, apply appropriately to your subject matter. But again, for literally a two second change of the model, it's a very, very easy way to to swap out a look and feel of your subject matter expertise. Um, finally, as a super, super bonus, um, sometimes you'll be wanting to multitask when you're rendering, especially if you have large render jobs. Well, there's this really cool node. It's under the vector nodes that'll actually play a sound. So if you hook this up to your um, you know, final step of your workflow, and then you do it, it's going to play a sound for you when that workflow is done. So uh, it's a two second thing, but it's been great because then now you don't have to be constantly flipping back and forth uh, to your images. As always, hope this was helpful. Please feel free to share, like, and subscribe, and we will catch you guys soon.